But uh, I think it's time for our first guest cast. Um, you know, Mark Bocek, I'm such a big fan of this guy. He's been in the sport for so long and um, he's such a great fighter. Yeah, he really is. You know, he's making his comeback um, at the Tough Nations finale. That's going to be on April 16th. Uh, he's, fa he's facing Evan Dunham, uh, who's a really well-rounded guy. Um, and they've, they've shared a lot of similar opponents. So it's going to be really interesting to see Mark Bocek coming back. He's had, how long has his life been up? I think a year? Um, over a year. He last fought in 2012. Wow. Yeah, so he took all of 2013 off. Yeah, you know, but Mark Bocek, I mean, he's a real veteran of the sport. He's been around since UFC 73. I mean, that was at least his UFC debut. Debuted against Frankie Edgar, you know what I mean? How tough is that? Um, and the guy, he's never had, you know, any back-to-back -back losses. Um, his last fight was uh, against uh, Rafael Dos Anjos at UFC 154, decision loss. So it's going to be interesting to see if he can bounce back against, uh, against Evan Dunham. That's right, and we got Mark on the line right now. So, ladies and gentlemen, our first guest for the day is going to be Mark Bocek. He's a two-time Submission of the Night winner, and it's a pleasure having him on. Mark, welcome to Submission Radio. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Mark. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, right off the bat, we wanted to ask, look, your last fight was in 2012. Um, you'll be fighting at the upcoming Ultimate Fighter Nations finale. Uh, why, why the long break in between fights? Uh, I didn't want to have the long layoff, you know. Um, I I wanted uh, just a just a short little break after, from my last fight to just uh, work on weak areas and work on the rest of my game and uh, try to reach the next level. Um, but the problem was during that period, uh, I suffered a bunch of injuries, so uh, it stretched me a lot back farther than I would have liked. Um, it wasn't the funnest position to be in, but that was the reality of it. Uh, but everything's going really good now, and uh, getting ready for next month. Did you want to? Did you want to tell us about some of those injuries? Uh, ankle, knee injuries, lig ligament issues. Uh, didn't didn't require surgery, uh, um, but they they accumulated one after another. Um, Mark, being out for so long, obviously so much had changed in um, the lightweight division um, in the UFC. Was it difficult to sit on the sidelines? and see so much stuff happening and not being able to participate in some of these great fights that have been happening? Uh, yeah, it was tough. I always like to get a, get a few fights in a year, but, uh, you know, it was, it was out of my control. There was nothing I could do. Um, so uh, as, soon as, as soon as the injuries got better, I, uh, I just uh, got, got back on the horse, back to improving, and uh, things, things are a lot better now. Look, it's it's still early in 2014. How many fights are you hoping to have this year? Um, well, I'd I'd like to get at least uh, at least two in this year, at least. But uh, you know, this is uh, this is a cra crazy sport we're in, so anything can happen. So I really only uh, plan or schedule or look at one at a time. Now, Mark, as you said, it is a bit of a long layoff. Um, what do you think about ring rust? Do you think this is a real thing? And um, if it is, how are you looking to combat that when you come back um, in a couple of months? I just think it's a, it's a mental thing, you know. It, it'll affect some people. It won't affect others. Uh, you know, it's like sh maybe like uh, short notice fights. Uh, some people respond really well to short notice fights. They're used to taking short notice fights. Uh, some don't, you know. Some... Uh, some Training camp does well on fight night. Uh, some could have a, a perfect training camp and have to stop some training, you know, because of say a cut or due to an injury. Uh, to some people, that won't be an issue. Miss, missing sparring sessions mentally, and for some people, it'll it'll really throw them off. So I think it. I think just my opinion. It depends on the on the person. Um, but you know, I can tell you from experience on fight on fight night. It, you know, everyone's good. Everyone's ready. It, it really is a bent mental on fight night. Yeah, you mentioned sparring, and I wanted to touch on that. A lot of people nowadays, they talk about training smart versus training hard. I mean, we're hearing people like Robbie Lawler saying he doesn't spar. Johnny Hendricks pretty much wears the helmet when he spars. I just wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, training back in the day versus training methods now, and, you know, what exactly are your methods? Well, sure. Um, I mean, I think, I think everyone should spar with the headgear. Uh, to begin with, I mean, you're just going to risk getting uh, getting cuts, which uh, which is not good. You know, you don't let them fully heal, especially close to a fight coming up. So I, I think everyone has to uh, has to 
you know, spar hard with the headgear. You know, then you look at the, you know, at the Robbie Lawler comments like, you know, I don't spar at all or I haven't sparred in four years. I mean, uh, is is it actually the hundred percent truth? Maybe it is. I I don't really know for sure, but you know. It, it, basically, what I think it comes down to, uh, it, it depends on the person and your experience value level. Meaning, uh, you know, Muay Thai fighters in Thailand or, say, Olympic level wrestlers, they don't have to kill themselves in training. They've been doing it since they were kids. So, you know, all they have to do is get, get into cardiovascular shape and, and they can perform well, right? But if you take uh, your average MMA fighter, they don't have, you know, uh, a, a lifelong of wrestling experience at an international level, or they don't have 300, let's say, Muay Thai fights, like, like some 25, like some early 20-year-olds in, in Thailand. So they can afford to not do that sparring. But an MMA fighter, say, with 10 fights, you, you don't have 300 fights, so you don't have that ex- experience of, you know, uh, taking shots brain conditioning, you know, seeing your own blood, those types of things. So mm. I think it depends on your experience level. Uh, you know, someone like Robbie Lawler, let's say, uh, you know, no, he doesn't have 300 Muay Thai fights, but again, he is at the upper echelon of his sport, of, of mixed martial arts, you know, very close fight with, with uh, Johnny Hendricks. So uh, it's different for, you know, every individual. What, you know, if, it, uh, if, it, if it's not broken, don't change it. Um, myself personally, I, I, I have to do some, some sparring with, you know, for timing and, and, and for my cardio uh, more, more than anything. So, uh, and, and I think that's the case with, you know, with, with most guys, you know, with George, with, mm-hmm. with, with all the top guys, you know, they, they have to, with jujitsu, it's easier because, you know, there's no, you, you're not going to pay for anything with strikes. If you know when to tap, it's basically 99% injury free and you know no uh unless no, no he, brain unless he battery. Jake, right? uh, yeah that's you know that that was a strange thing that was mm. a very strange thing i've been doing bjj 17 years that's never happened to me you know i guess there's you know there's exceptions to rules there's freak freak accidents but uh i, I was i'll be honest i was surprised to hear that yeah, I think we were as well. Even the fact that he's, you know, he's still out, still on the shelf, considering he was, you know, on. He had a title shot. He had a title fight coming up. That's right. Now, uh, Mark, speaking of training, um, you and Evan, you're both veterans of the sport. Um, where have you been training for this fight, and um, who have you brought in to uh, help you get ready for it? Um, I actually haven't haven't brought in anyone. I've just I've just brought myself to uh, <laughs> to Montreal. <laughs> I've brought myself to Montreal to try Star Gym. Uh, so I'm working here with all the boys. I've been here for the past uh, for the past two months. Uh, you know, Firas, You know, George. You know, all all the boys here. So I've been been here the last little while and uh, just uh, you know here on a mission, just training. Now, Mark, uh, the first time you fought in UFC was at UFC 73, which was in 2007, uh, which is crazy to think. Um, obviously, in terms of production, when you watch the show, it's very similar. But backstage and the feel of the event, has it changed much from then to now, now that it's a global sport? Um, I mean, as, as far as the organization, not, not so much. They've, they've always been very organized. They've always been, they've always been on the ball and basically whatever they tell you uh they they follow through with it so so they wouldn't make any uh they wouldn't make any false claims but with, with the growth of the sport you know now there's just uh there's just much more uh media obligations okay fair enough um another thing I wanted to touch on recently mac danzig retired and obviously you are a veteran yourself i um, mean mac is someone who you have fought in the past and, uh, you know, he seemed to have a fair few hardships during his career. You, however, have never lost two in a row. What goes through your mind when you see a lot of other veterans of the sport, like your Mac Danzi, Chris Lieben, Kenny Florian, guys like that retiring? What, what do you think about for yourself? Uh, I, think you, I think, again, is that's going to be something uh, individual. You know, you can, you can get a guy like Joe Stevenson, who's, you know, been fighting pro since he's 16 years old, and, you know, late 20s, he's, he's burned out. He's just had... He's just had too many. Uh, he's had too many fights, and then you know you can you can look at a guy like uh, like let's say uh, you know Rick Hahn, who's 37 years old, 
you know, who's who's training here at TriStar as well, and he, he, you know, he looks he looks better than ever. You know, he he looks as good as as anybody. So it's it's just individual. It's a, it's a mental thing. If you're not if mentally you you know you don't want to fight anymore and you're just doing it for money, you you should stop. It's it's a really it's a really difficult way to make money. And I I, I mean. I, I, w- I would think one of the worst jobs on on the planet if you're not enjoying it. Mm. Now, uh, Mark, w- one of the questions is obviously when you first started in, in the UFC, uh, the title was an aspiration of yours. Now that you're coming back after the injuries, what are some of your goals in the lightweight division that you are uh, aiming towards? Um, I'm I'm really uh, I'm really lasered in on Evan. Um, to me, he's he's very. Uh, He's very tough. I know. I know he didn't have the best showing against uh, against Cerrone, uh, you know. But but I think that was maybe more of a mental blip than than anything. Uh, he he's always willing to put it on the line, and and uh, I I think he's better than what he showed in his uh, in his last fight. And in my opinion, he beat Dos Anjos. So to me, that's that's like that's fighting a top ten guy. You know, the, the rankings don't mean much. They they change from fight to fight, and that's very subjective. Uh, there's, there's there's a lot of very variability in the sport. But uh, to me, Evan Evan is a top ten guy, and you know he's he's a he, he's a big hurdle. He's a big test. So uh, I think a, a victory there would, you know, p- propel me right back up there again. Mm, I believe it would. I mean, especially in the lightweight division, you can look at almost the top, you know, the top fifteen, top twenty, and it's it, it is a, a shark tank in there. Um, sure. What, what would your biggest takeaways be from the Dos Anjos fight? And uh, are you doing anything different with your fight for for Dunham? Uh, yeah, you know, I've I've changed my uh, strength and conditioning around. Uh, you know, Dos Anjos, uh, he's he's a pretty complete fighter. You know, as is Dunham. You can look at those two guys, and it's like. Nothing looks like there's no sure there's weaknesses and room for improvement, but there's not. It, it's hard to find any gaping, gaping holes that lack. You know, they're 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 top of the food chain guys. Um, you know, but but with that, I think uh, you know the the my my mind is sharper. Um, I've, I've 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 worked more on weaknesses. I've worked more on all the all the areas, but not just the. You know specific areas of say striking, wrestling, or, or jujitsu, but you know their their applications for MMA, which you know at times can be a little different than you mm. know someone who's just teaching jujitsu but has never been in an MMA fight, or someone telling you you know you have to train with the gi to be good in MMA, but you know those people generally don't fight that preach that. Uh, Mark, that's a very interesting point. One of the things um, I love to do when I watch one of your fights is um, the, the way you take people down. I mean, uh, a lot of people have said it. You have uh, some of the best takedowns in the lightweight division. Um, do you think uh, wrestling for MMA and wrestling in general is a little bit different? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, in MMA, you don't, you know, if we start striking, you know, we start standing up, we start striking. So you can't be. You can't be hunched over, and because you don't have contact initially with the person, you have to shoot from a little bit farther away, or you're going to get hit. Uh, so this doesn't happen in wrestling. So that's why you can see really high-level wrestlers struggle with takedowns. You know, and you can see a guy like, let's say, uh, GSP, who doesn't really have any formal background, but um, he's he's very good at masking striking with wrestling. You know, you're thinking striking he's setting up takedowns you you're thinking sprawling he's he's setting up you know jabs or or other other types of strikes so you know learning and being comfortable with that range lets you shoot from a closer distance you know you could be an olympic olympic gold medalist but if you're shooting from halfway across the ring the other guy doesn't have to be uh, he doesn't have to have the best sprawl to stop the takedown, you know. And if you'd like an example, you know, let's look at uh, Townsend Saunders versus uh, Mikey Burnett or versus Pac Militic back in the day. Yeah. Mm. You know, on the wrestling mat, he'd wipe the floor with those guys. It wouldn't even be, it wouldn't even be right. But you know, MMA, he's not comfortable with striking. He's shooting from much farther away. Those guys have all, you know, did did some college wrestling, so you know, their sprawl is good enough to stop a shot from a half mile away 
Mm. Then you, so, then you've it's, got... it's, so it's understanding how to mix them <clears throat> together. We've got Yol Romero as well, who I believe he's a silver medalist, and he saw his last fight. You know, it was more like a brawl, and he even got taken down. Which, in theory, on the wrestling mat, there's no chance it would even happen. Um, but I guess my question is, you know, given the fact that you and George both train Tristar, and you both have tremendous takedowns, is this something that you guys, you know, you would practice together, or you both learnt off each other, or it's just coincidental? Uh, yeah, we drill it a lot. You know, jo- you know, George isn't fighting right now, but he's still training a lot, and he's still. He's still uh, he's very happy to help everyone out, and uh, you know we just we just you know drill a lot from you know striking range to wrestling range as, as a lot of the uh, as a lot of the camps are doing now, which is the smart thing. Um, a, a guy like Romero, you know that that guy's yeah he is a silver medalist. That's a special athlete. Uh, you know he's he's one of those rarities. You know he he did get into MMA a little bit later. Mm. Um, but if if you almost notice in his fights, it's uh, uh, you know even though you know because the, the other fighters are, are are improving and evolving in the the striking to wrestling range, you you do see see his butt hit the mat. <laughs> we all know anyone can get taken down in MMA, um, but he's uh, he's very hard to hold down. Generally, you know his, his butt hits the mat, his shoulder touches the mat, but. It, it, it almost seems like it's not a big deal to him because it, it almost looks like as if he knows, you know, he's been wrestling his whole life. I can kind of pop back up whenever I want, and, and that's what he's <laughs> been doing. You know, not that you'd want to get taken down, but he, he, he does do a very good job of popping back up. Now, uh, Mark, since we uh, are talking a little bit about GSP, just in your opinion, um, do you think he will return to the UFC, or do you think he's legitimately done with MMA? It's it's tough to say, you know. Uh, a, a lot of people ask me that because I, you know, I I, I train with the guy, and you know, he's a, he's a, he's a great guy and uh, and a great friend. Um, but he he has to deal with so many, you know, mm. you know, like cameras and interviews and you know all that all that stuff all the time. So uh, so whenever whenever I speak with him, I you know other people do. But I never bring those. I never bring those issues up. I never bring them to light. I never, I never uh, speak about them with him, because um, he, he he gets that like basically left, right, and center. So mm. I'm not even I'm not even a hundred percent sure. But what I can tell you is he's you know he he is training like crazy. Um, you know, actually <laughs> maybe even uh, maybe even more people that that might even you know have fights coming up. You know he. he it's almost like he uh, maybe he doesn't feel normal if he doesn't train, you know. But yeah. It's what he's done for such a long time, so he he enjoys it. But he is training hard, but it's it's almost like a like a reset where when you started martial arts, there's no pressure, no competition, no fighting. It was just something cool, and you'd learn counters and you know what's the setup here. You learn BJJ, mm. the sweep, the counter. It, it was enjoyable. It was. Uh, it was an addiction, and he's working with all types of coaches. So, I think he's almost in uh, in that type of no pressure zone again, where it's you know pure, pure uh, like an like an addiction and enjoyment. And is is that where you found yourself during your injuries? Obviously, you didn't have many fights lined up, um, so you were still training. But were you doing that for the pure enjoyment of the sport as well? Yeah, it was it was enjoyable. It, it's uh, you know learning new skills is is enjoyable for me. Uh, training camps at times uh, it's, it's, it's not the funnest thing but uh, you know the the sacrifice has to be done okay Mark I wanted to ask you also another one of the big changes that have happened recently is the changes with uh, obviously fighters going to fight pass which affects sponsors and then you've got the way uh, the you know bonuses of the night come out um, you did have an incident with a sponsor last year uh, does this does this help you as far as your or how does this change your screening process for sponsors in the future? I'm I'm sorry. What what happened exactly? With with yourself? Uh, no, with with the actual sponsors. What changed? Well, a lot of people are saying like now that if you if you're going to go on Fight Pass, sponsors might not be as willing to sponsor fighters because instead of being say on on a pay per view card, they're going to be you know broadcast over the internet and then. With the alleged UFC uniform coming out, that might limit the sponsors even more. So, uh, right, yeah, I actually, 
I haven't actually heard anything from UFC about the actual uniform. You know, I hear, hear the rumors like everyone else. Yeah. Uh, but they, they haven't said anything for sure. I'm, I'm sure there might be other people that know. I haven't heard anything yet. Um, I did hear that they, you know, they'd, they'd still allow some sponsors over the, the over the uniform if that was actually going to happen. But, uh, you know, don't take my word for it. I don't know for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, at the... You know, at the at the moment, they've been pretty liberal with the with the uh, with the sponsors. You know, and the you know the big ones are taxed; they pay a fee. But you know, the the big ones can afford that. Now, um, in terms of sponsorship in MMA, Mark, um, in 2012, after one of your fights, you had a little bit of an issue with a sponsor, um, obviously paying a little bit late. And um, there's no need to name who the sponsor was or anything like that. But right. going forward into your next fight. Um, is it something that you think about when choosing your sponsors? Um, is is there a tr oh, yeah, trust, absolutely. Factor, trust factor that you're going to be thinking about going into this one? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, even with with at all you know previous sponsors that I uh, that I ever had, you know, we always we always have a contract, an agreement set up, signed before anything happens. But uh, you know, we quickly learned that a contract and collecting are two completely mm -hmm. different things. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, we still, you know, we still always do, uh, do, do an agreement, you know, past a little, just email agreement, like an actual, you know, signed agreement. We always do that. Um, I, still a lot of agents aren't doing that any, anyways, that, you know, from my understanding, um, you know, you, you hear things about certain, uh, certain sponsors. It's, it's a, it's a small community. If someone doesn't end up paying, you know, everyone's going to tend to tend to start to hear about it. So the word of mouth goes around pretty quick. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, ex I'm extremely selective. Um, I wanted to ask just touching on your, on your past. Now we're going back a few years now, but uh, I think it's pretty common knowledge. You were actually one of, uh, you were Dana White and the Fatita brothers, one of their first jiu-jitsu teachers, you know, teaching them in the early days of BJJ. What was that like and how were they as far as BJJ practitioners go? Um, it was it was very cool, um, but you know I don't know if I could really call myself their instructor. It was more like I was kind of there at the at the beginning, and I helped them for uh, you know like a, like a brief two three week period uh, in the year uh, I believe it was the year two thousand. Uh, basically, what had happened was I was uh, I was training in Vegas at the time. I was uh, you know eighteen year old purple belt, and. Wow. Uh, all I all I all I did was live, breathe, train jujitsu. When I wasn't training, I was watching videotapes, and I, I was fairly decent on the on the competition circuit. So uh, uh, my instructor at the time, would, who had given me my purple belt, you know, John Lewis, who at the time was uh, Andre Pedernera's uh, North American affiliate, um, was actually uh, uh, he, he began teaching and, and coaching. Uh, Dana, Frank, and Lorenzo in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, but since it was three of them, you know, it's always good to have a have an extra guy, and you know, you can see you can see more. You know, you don't have one guy just lagging around, and especially if he's a he's a sharper Jiu-Jitsu mind, it, it you know it helps even more because John was just one person. Uh, so that's how I actually met uh, Frank, uh, Lorenzo, and Dana. Sorry, Lorenzo and Dana. Uh, and at the time, I didn't really knew. I, I didn't really know who they were, um, but after that three-week period, I think maybe maybe it was six to eight months later or something. I, I forget exactly when the purchase was, but it was after after I met them. Uh, I realized, oh, they purchased UFC. Very, very interesting. <laughs> so, just between us and the listeners at home, um, who was it? A pretty fierce rivalry in the gym between Lorenz and Dana. Who who got the upper hand sometimes when they were rolling? Actually, not 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 really at all. Surprisingly, it was it was purely just you know fun. You know, they they weren't even you know. I'm sure they they did when I wasn't when I wasn't there at other times, but they weren't really you know sparring hard or sparring to win. It was just more of a of a flow, feel, learn type of uh, type of role, followed by a lot of uh, you know technique repetition. So you know they were just. They just they just loved it, you know. They were just having uh, having fun with it. Mm. You mentioned that uh, you, you didn't really know who who they were in the beginning, and I wouldn't I wouldn't fault you for that because back in the day, Dana White he sort of came off as like this shy, timid guy. 
Um, he, he, he looked, he honestly, he looked so awkward in a suit back in the day. And now <laughs> you, see, you see him doing, you know, you see him doing these crazy press conferences and dropping F-bombs here and there. Personally, I, I love, I love that, you know, he's, he's so, you know, honest about things like that. I mean, he doesn't really hide sure. who he is. Do you, yeah, do you, do you see any contrasting memories of the old Dana Y? you know, maybe back when he's a little bit quieter? Um, yeah, he, he was a lot quieter back then. You know, uh, I, I understand what he's doing. He's, you know, he's really trying to push the sport and and build the sport. And obviously, you know, him and him and uh, UFC Co are doing doing a, a great job with that. Um, he, he was a lot quieter back then, but you know, yeah, like I said, he was just just trying to push the sport. Uh, some people think it's a little, you know, too might think uh, it's too aggressive with uh, with the swearing or with the with the cursing but uh you know i think in in a in a way people respect uh him for being real and not putting on a show cuz they could probably sense if it uh you know if if it might be a little fake like like people can sense when you know there's certain pre-fight hype with guys that you know maybe supposedly uh are supposed to hate each other but you know, they, they they really don't. It's just kind of pre-fight hype, and, and and you see that you see that in many fights. You know, you know, none off the top of my head, but you, you see it in many fights where, you know, after a fight, it was just like, hey, it was you know, it's nothing personal, just trying to build a fight. Mm -hmm. You know. Now, uh, Mark, one of the changes that's been made by Dana is the uh, new bonus system. You're a two-time submission of the night winner. Um, what are your thoughts on this new bonus system? Do you like it? Um, what do you think? Does it, do you think it impacts on you at all? Um, yeah, I like it a lot. Uh, there's there's more opportunity to to win the bonus now, so it's not just relegated to you know KO submission or fight of the night. You can you know you can have multiple performances of the night. So you know if you put on a good performance, you're going to be rewarded. So uh... yeah, I'm, I mean I'm of the opinion that people should be able to vote for it. I think it might get to a point. Where after a card, you might be able to vote for who you think gets uh, the best performance of the night or something like that. What do you think? Mark, are you there? Okay, I think we've had some tef uh, technical difficulties. I think Mark Bocek got disconnected. Um, we are running a little bit long in the show at the moment, so we're going to see if we can maybe get Mark back uh, a little bit later. Um, but I think, Dennis, at this point, it's probably time to uh, move on with our next guest. What do you think? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we've got a huge guest coming up next, so I'm, I'm very, very excited. We spoke about him before, and uh, before we go on to the next guest, guys, be aware that uh, we are releasing a Submission Radio First Fight series. We will let you know more information about that through our official Twitter page, which is Submission AUS, Submission Oz. Uh, so it's Twitter slash Submission Oz. You go on there for all the latest information, and uh, you will be pleasantly surprised by this uh, Submission Radio First Fight series that we have coming out. Yeah, I can't wait. We'll be right back uh, with Tyron Woodley. <laughs> 